Hello and welcome to Taskmaster Talks with Kevin Sullivan. I am your co-host, JP John Paz from the two-man power trip of wrestling. Of course, the host of the show, the man that's the former WCW and ECW World Tag Team Champion, one of the greatest bookers in the history of professional wrestling, Mr. Kevin Sullivan. Kevin, how are you doing today? And we have a special guest. Yes, uh, this is a huge 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 thing for me to have ronald fuller and i've mentioned this before too i've wrestled all over the world i never worked for a more honest promoter than ronald fuller ronald overpaid guy sometimes i shot an angle in san francisco and san francisco was dead with my father and bob root it was Ray Stevens had left, Pat Patterson had left, uh, Ivia had left, Turtle dead. We shot the angle with my father. Root got to my father. We had four consecutive sellouts. Shires didn't give my father a dime when I did the same angle with Tanaka in Knoxville. Not only did Ronald pay for my dad's ticket, he gave him, and he didn't have to because my dad was coming down to visit me. He gave him a main event payoff. That's the kind of guy Ronald Fuller is. And Ronald Fuller, everybody wanted to go to either Knoxville or Pensacola. You either lived on the lake in Knoxville or you lived on the beach in Pensacola. It was a dream existence. And Ronald, a lot of people don't know this, and I do because I'm a dinosaur. I've been around forever. Ronald was on the short list one time to be the world heavyweight champion. Mr. Fuller, let me welcome you into the show. How are you doing? And is that true? Were you, uh, you know, obviously one of the greatest bookers of all time, the Tennessee stud. Were you scheduled to be a world champion at any point? Well, you know, I'm not, I, I, nobody ever said that to me, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but I did, uh, I spent a lot of time in St. Louis, 73 and 74. And obviously, if you went there on a regular basis, you were being looked at. And uh, I worked there probably uh, 40 times in 1973 and 74, including televisions, a lot of TVs there. So, you know, there, 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 I was, uh, I was big, I was big, you know, 6'9", uh, about 265, 270. Uh, I could wrestle, uh, you know, I had a bat wrestling background, came from a family with a huge wrestling background. And, uh, you know, so I think, uh, you know, probably they were. Uh, I know that Jack Briscoe was the world champion. Uh, he was there in 71, 72 a lot in St. Louis. And about 73, he became world champion. So there could have been the chance that uh, I was being looked at as well. Yeah, and you got to remember, Eddie had a lot of influence then. Yeah, and Eddie, for sure. Eddie, and Eddie and Ron's dad were very close. Plus, it would have been real conducive for our territory, meaning Florida, to have Ronald used to promote uh, West Palm Beach. It'd been great for another one of the Florida boys to win the belt. It would just give him more prestige. But that Eddie was the one that told me he was on the short list. So. I don't think he would, you know, talk oh, about yeah. it if he did. I wish you'd have told yeah. me that, Kev. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I didn't, yeah, that's I, didn't leave, I, didn't, I didn't want you to leave West Palm because you paid so good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid your Uncle Lester would have gone in there. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that would have been a bad deal. So Yeah. So where did you two first meet? Like, what year is it and, and where? is it? Would it be Florida? No, I, I'll take that question because Ronald probably doesn't remember because I was just a punk kid. Ronald and I started almost the same time. I met Ronald and Robert in Atlanta, and that was in 1970. And then after that, I went to Pensacola. And from Pensacola, I teamed up with Robert, and Robert brought me down to Florida in 72. But I met uh Ronald, because I was only in Atlanta a short period, and his dad was the owner and hired me. Yeah. 
Yeah, we were both there uh, probably. Uh, I was starting, me and Rob both starting in 1970, summer of 70. I just yeah. got out of the University of Miami, started uh, started wrestling uh, probably June of 1970. So that uh, that goes back a little ways, don't it, Kevin? It, uh, it, yeah, it yeah. does because I came in at the end of uh, August and stayed till uh, the second week of December. So yeah, we go back a long ways. Yeah. Um, and and John, a lot of people don't know this. They always talk about the Samoan dynasty, and I'm mm -hmm. not taking anything away from them. But there's been no bigger dynasty than the full of Welsh fields, you know. They ran almost the entire south from and southwest from Arizona to Florida up to uh, Tennessee to Alabama to Missouri. They ran the whole, the whole I'd say, at least the fourth of the country at one time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My granddad, uh, the one time back in the forties, uh, ran twelve states in the south, basically. Uh, Arkansas, Missouri, uh, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, West Virginia, uh, Virginia, some places in Virginia. I mean, uh, he was just all over the South. And uh, he yeah. he had his brothers. He got everybody in the family involved. And I'm part of the oldest and largest wrestling family in the world. And been around a long, long time, that's for sure. Who else is in the wrestling family? I mean, obviously you, your brother, Roy Lee Welsh, uh, your father. Who else is in it? Like, who, who's who's the the whole you know the whole uh, family, if you will, the the whole group? Well, my grandfather started in 1920. Uh, he, he was uh, trained by the original Dutch Mantel. Came from the out in the Panhandle area of Texas. Uh, he had three brothers: Lester Welch, uh, Herb Welch, and Jack Welch. All of those wrestled. Uh, they all had sons. Herb had two sons at wrestle. Lester had two sons at wrestle. Uh, Jack didn't have any sons. He had a daughter that wrestled. Uh, and uh, then uh, my grandfather had several sisters. One of them married a guy named Virgil Hatfield. And uh, he had three sons. And they became the Fields brothers in the, 19, the late 1950s. I bought out my dad's first territory, which was Gulf Coast Wrestling. And stayed down there. They all had sons. Uh, my dad uh, was the son of Roy. My grandfather had one son, obviously. And uh, then uh, Roy, I mean, uh, dad had Rob and I. Uh, I got a son. I have a son that wrestled, uh, Jimmy Golden. There's a Golden family. My cousin named Golden, that uh, my dad's sister's husband. Uh, he's the son of uh, Bill Golden. I mean, it's just, it goes forever. I think there's about yeah. 24, 24 people in the family that have either been yeah. promoters, wrestlers, or referees. A lot of them, are maybe not I remember uh, Golden's name, but that's Bunkhouse Bunk. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they could run a territory between them. We talked about this the other day. Between them and, and, and the Armstrongs, they could fill up a card for months without having to bring anybody in. Because yeah. every one yeah. of them work. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we just about did that, Kev. Yeah, <laughs> on several of occasions, you know, there were probably uh, there were probably six Armstrongs and Fullers and and Goldens and, and family members, Roy Lee. I mean, it was just um, you know, uh, we we really had uh, quite a feud going on for a lot of years with the Armstrongs. Yeah, one of yeah. the greatest uh, wrestling feuds of all time, no doubt about it. What are kind of some of your memories of Bullet Bob? First, I'll start with uh, Ron, since that was your fe big feud for many, many years. Yeah, uh, I mean, he, tremendous wrestler, tremendous person, uh, really great guy, uh, just uh, a salt of the earth. I mean, uh, great with fans, uh, tremendous in the ring. What a talent he was. Uh, and uh, he, he was a partner, one of our partners, the only partner I had that wasn't a family member uh, in my southeastern Pensacola company uh, in Continental that turned into Continental Wrestling later on it was Bob Armstrong. And, and then when Bob had his sons came along and they were small boys when we first got together and they turned out to be, uh, we stayed together long enough that they all grew up and got in the ring. And so 
you know, and I worked with Bob Armstrong maybe 300 times would be a get, pretty good guess, you know, uh, uh, just as a heel, sometimes as a baby face. Uh, I would, he turned heel. I was a baby face. I was a baby face. He turned heel. I mean, it just was back and forth and back and forth. And, but what a tremendous talent and a tremendous person, a great guy, uh, married to the same woman for 60 years. Uh, and all of his, and you know, all of his sons still married to the same woman. I mean, uh, he, he raised his family, right. He was just a great guy, a Marine. He, he did it all. He, he was he was a, a iconic figure in wrestling, in my opinion. Yes, and I have to agree with him. And you know, all of his kids were fabulous workers, but Bob was the be one of the best baby faces I saw. Nobody made a comeback like Bob Armstrong. Bob made this big comeback fire. I mean, it, uh, I work with Bob quite a bit. Because when I worked for Ronald, I was a heel. Uh, Bob and the the they were all great. Brad was a great worker. Scott and Steve were good workers. And the one that was not the best worker of all was the one that made the most money. Road Dog. I mean, Brian yep. was a fat. I gave Brian his first match. I was in Norfolk at the Scope Auditorium. And we were missing a guy, and he came in, and I said, "Hey, you're wrestling tonight." He was a lead. He was a marine. He says, "I don't have any uh, outfit." I, I said, "Your brother's here. Use some of his." He says, "I've never worked." I said, "You're an Armstrong. You know how to work from the day you've been born." So just get, and he went. He went about nine minutes, and he he did really good. So I mean, there's something that to be said about that second generation. Yeah, and that yeah. and that Armstrong Fuller's feud. I mean, that is just the uh, the stuff of legends. How does that chemistry kind of come about with you guys? Because it just seems like that feud just kind of is one of those feuds that never ends, and it was just always great. Uh, I mean, you just some sometimes you work with a guy, and and it just clicks, you know. And, and uh, when that's the the case, you want to continue that process. You want to continue working with that person as much as possible. Uh, we own the own the company. We own the territory, so obviously we were in a position to where we could work with each other as much as we wanted to, and and we just always had great matches. Uh, he turned, uh, I was I turned heel on him. I went into Pensacola in that territory as a heel, uh, and turned on, and then he turned on me later on, and then I and then he turned back baby face. Uh, I mean, we just uh, went back and forth and back and forth, and. And it, it didn't make any difference. So whether you were heel or a baby face, whether your storyline was good, if your matches were great, it didn't make any difference. People just seemed to really enjoy watching us work. And I love working with Bob. He was a tremendous worker. Whether he was a heel or a baby face, he was really great. And the other thing is, it's kind of hard not to uh, keep doing it when you're packing the buildings. They yeah. were packing it. Yes, and like Ron said, it didn't matter. They were so over, it didn't matter to the people whether they were booing with them or cheering them. They just they knew they were going to see an incredible match. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's a that's part of the secret. I mean, uh, you know, obviously, like I said, you click. If it clicks, uh, then you're going you're going to have a great match. It doesn't make any difference what your storyline is, what your angle is, what the program you're working is. Uh, you're going to go to that ring and you know you're going to tear the house down every night. And as Kevin was saying, we were selling out uh, for years and years and years in every city we went to. So we must have been doing something right for sure. Yeah, no uh, doubt about that. As far as booking and booking philosophies, kind of, Kevin, what's your philosophy? And then, you know, Ron, will go to you about kind of your booking philosophies because they seem so much different. Are they really that much different? Oh, well, they're, they're, they're actually almost the same i mean okay I, yeah. I, I don't think there's you know ronald had his father who was an incredible booker plus he was around eddie who was an incredible booker and then <clears throat> ronald and i mentioned a name that nobody knows who was the best unknown booker in the world leo garibaldi 
And Ronald and I are under the impression that to get people into the building, you have to have heat on your heel. The baby faces can't win the first time. They have to overcome adversity and eventually you let the baby face win, but not when the people think he's going to win. And Ronald built his territories around heels, like when he brought in uh, the Mongolian Stomper, who drew money for years. Then he had uh, Ronnie Garvin, who drew money. Then he had Alexei Smirnoff, and he brought in Toro Tanaka. So he brought in heels that were believable, uh, and that the thing was, they were usually much larger than the baby face. So it gave it that southern flavor, too, where the baby face was fighting from the bottom and he was selling his ass off like Ricky Morton does. And that's why I think our booking is very similar. Because you have to, in my mind, I stole a lot of what I did from Ronald was you had to make the people believe it. And if you can continue a feud to draw money, do not cut it off just because it's going. If it's like, it's like a boat, Ronald, I, I used to uh, go boating with Ronald when we both lived in the Keys. And down there, there's a saying, if your boat isn't broken, don't fix it. So if you're driving for money, don't don't try to change the the money angles because they may not work. If you got something working, stay with it. And I learned that from Ronald. That's a you know, uh, and you're right about that, Kev. I mean, uh, obviously, it, it's all around the hills. Uh, all of, all of, all the wrestling business, I believe, is built around great hills. Uh, once you've got a great crew of hills. Uh, you're going to draw money, and uh, I've gone into territories when we, we when we went down to uh, southeastern in Pensacola, and the Fields brothers had been there for many years. It'd been dead for a long time. People said you'll never draw money there again, and uh, I took down a great group of heels. And six months, we started selling out buildings. And we went from giving money back to the fans uh, on the first probably eight, ten shows that we ran didn't have enough people in the crowd to even run the show to six months later selling the buildings out and all based upon the heat with heels. David Schultz, uh, we had uh, Randy Colley and uh, Roger Smith, Assassins. Uh, I was in the crew. Uh, we just had a bunch of really great heels. And, uh, you know, that was the secret in the South. You, you had that heat, you were going to draw money. You didn't have heat, you weren't going to draw money. It was pretty simple. You know, if you didn't have yeah. any hot heels and you, you were smart not to beat your heels very often, you let them win. They carried the belts. They 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 ran the show basically for the fans, and it just kept the fans coming back wanting to see somebody beat these guys. And, uh, I, you know, that all came from my dad. That came from my dad's dad. <laughs> His territory way back in the 30s uh, was full of great heels. Love that philosophy too. You know, even Kev, even the NWO, you just keep building the heel heat, right? Building the heat, building the heat, and look at it just balloons up and becomes this huge, huge monster. Yeah, and what yeah. happens is, and I saw Ronald do it. Ronald knows this. You get a heel hot enough. We saw it in Florida. We were there. You get a heel hot enough, the people are going to turn them baby face. Then you really have a run. Oh, yeah. They finally get behind the heel, and he saved, like, Piper saved Gordon Soley, Dusty saved Mike Graham from Park Song. I mean, uh, I don't know what the angle was with uh, Bob turning on uh, Ron, but the, then you have another run. If you get a guy burning hot, eventually the people are going to go with the winner. You know what I mean? And, and I, I, again, that's something I learned from Ronald, too. Because yeah, I you, actually worked with the Mongolian Stomper when he was a babyface, and I was the heel. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, that's, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. It sure is, you know. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a surefire winner. 
you get a tremendous yeah. heel that's got great heat. And then you have the right heels that are uh, in the same group with him and the good good guys for him to turn on and become a baby face. And, and it does like just like 74 with uh, with uh, Dusty Rhodes and Pac Song and that group of heels. Uh, when they yeah. turn dusty baby face, it just, it ignites the territory it, and it does it every time. It ain't just one time. It'll do it every time. Right. Awesome stuff. Now, Ron, as far as, you know, the psychology of the book, you know, we're saying, you know, it build, you know, definitely build heat and build the heels. What's kind of your like underlining psychology as far as getting the, the baby face over? Not necessarily a turn, but getting him over. Is it sympathy? Like, how is it? How's a good way to kind of, you know, build your baby face? But, you know, obviously you, you got uh, you got television programs and in your TV, that's where you can really u- utilize your television to get your baby faces over. You give them a lot of wins on TV. Uh, you start them out with guys that uh, that are not really good and aren't big names and and they kind of build up and uh, you beat your your second tier te- heels with them and uh and eventually you know you through your tv you've got a way to build your baby face obviously sooner or later that big baby face is going to get a win over that big heel and get the belt and when that happens then he's established he's there then after that point you don't have to worry about it then you start looking for the second baby face to do it with you know and you just uh, continue to build stronger crew your heels ought to be all strong uh, you can make every guy on your card a star. And I used to try to do that back when I was promoting. I had a great crews all the time. Uh, guys that worked in the first match could work in the main event the next week. It was, uh, and everybody was over. You, and you angled everybody. Everybody was involved. And then you basically paid guys pretty much the same, but the money was so good that everybody was happy with the money too. And uh, if you could do that in your territory, you were you were gonna you were gonna you're gonna make money, and you were gonna make your boys money. They were gonna make money too. One of the major things I learned from Ronald, and it just clicked back in my head when he said it. When I would book my cards, and you know, my when my territory that I did was burning hot, the most important match for me was my first match. Because I I saw what Ronald did, and he's telling the truth. A guy that worked on the first match in Knoxville could have worked the next week on the main event, and nobody came to the buildings late. And I and I caught that from Ronald because before I had been in other territories, not Florida. See, Ronald learned in Florida. Other territories you go to, you see them. They start off with matches with young guys that. Uh, uh, inexperienced, which that's okay. We all start somewhere, but you don't put them against another inexperienced guy and stink to join up. And the people look at each other and say, "Wow!" When you start out with a match like uh, a Brad Armstrong versus a Tim Horner, you know you're going to have an incredible match, and it's going to be a wrestling match. And you set the tone because at the end of the night, Bob Armstrong and Ronald Fuller are going to be out on the floor beating each other with stairs, clubs, everything. But you started out with wrestling, and you didn't let them go to the floor. You didn't let them uh, keep jumping off the top rope. You didn't, And you made it. <laughs> when you cheated, you cheated behind the referee's back, not right in front of them. And I learned that from Ronald. And I think, you know, uh, Ronald's background was helped a lot of guys that became bookers like Paul Edler for me and uh, and and Dusty and I mean we we all kind of came out of the same camp whether it was Bill Watts too Bill said he wrestling when he went to Florida it was like he got his PhD in booking you, there were, there's a way to build cards. There's a way to draw money. And there's something they don't do, Ronald. And you did it, and Florida Office did it. And I never could understand why they didn't do it in today's wrestling. 
You know, they don't run that many house shows, and they wonder why they're not trying. I remember what, when we had an angle in a house show, we'll say in Tampa, they would shoot, we'll say Bob and, and uh, uh, Bob Armstrong and Ronald were in a uh, feud. They would shoot a hot angle in Tampa at the building, the house show, and show it on TV. And people would say, holy shit, look what they did. And they'd be, they say, well, they're in Miami Wednesday night. Let's get down there and see that. They, they took, they utilized every aspect of the business they could to, to draw money. I mean, after, after a while, why would you go to a house show where you know uh, a title is never going to change? It's going to change on a pay-per-view constantly. They never change a title. So <laughs> right away, you're giving it away, which we all know is too late. But you can still make it where people want to go to a building and see Russ. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and the name on the marquee is wrestling. Man, uh, right. you want to give them that. Uh, you want to give them at least one true wrestling match in every card if you can do that because you want yeah, – that sets the tone for everything. Uh, you know, then you can do anything. Whatever you do after you have a really great wrestling match uh, that isn't wrestling, fight outside, whatever it may be, it has more impact than it would if right. you did it in every match. It would mean nothing. So you don't well, do it in every match. You save that for the last match, but you give them wrestling as much as you can Do you get to that last one. Well, Ronald kept the great Tony Charles employed for the end of his career because Tony gave you the best basic wrestling match possible. And uh, Tony never really was in the main event unless it was a very hard angle. But Tony was always in the position to after uh, before a wild match that he would go out there and do all the amazing wrestling that he could, especially if he had an opponent like Les Thornton or Brad Armstrong, you know, and then you see this great wrestling match. And then what we said afterwards, then you see a fist fight, just about a pair six bra as Gordon would say. And it, it just emphasizes it more. Yeah. It just makes it stronger. Hey, you mentioned yeah. a couple of the guys we used to have a match regularly with Charles and Les Thornton or, or Tony yeah. Charles and Brad Armstrong. Uh, Brad Armstrong and Arn Anderson when Arn was young. I mean, uh, just uh, tremendous young talent that you taught you, you insisted that they wrestle. You didn't tell them to go out there. I don't want you to use any, don't cheat if you don't have to. I mean, if, if you do, hide it from the ref. You know, and uh, once you train those guys like that, uh, that, that's the way that wrestlers should be trained. I think that's why they don't do it, Kev, today. They don't draw the money, you know, as they just don't. They've lost that whole concept of uh, how to set up your night. And your night began with that first match. If your first match got everybody on their feet, you're not going to, they're not going to sit down all night. They're going to love right. every match. And, uh, you know, that's, that doesn't seem like that they've they discovered that at all. Well, the, there's uh, Joey Kabibo who runs uh, e, uh, the, uh, PCW called, Ultra. Uh, yeah, PCW Ultra. He learned from us, Ronald, because that's how he books his card. And I've been down there a few times. Well, you and I have talked about it. He runs a damn good show. And the people, uh, I mean, he's had a hundred thousand dollar gate an independent show with Muda, so that says something. Oh yeah, you're talking about the guy in uh, California there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah, from what you explained to me, and uh, yeah, he he yeah. runs it, you know. And I think you know, you told me he's kind of a young guy, and he takes yeah. advice from guys like you, guys like Terry Funk that goes in there and work for him some, and. And uh, right. old timers that really know how to get it done, and uh, right. and to build the territory, to build a town, uh, to build a company, and uh, and you, if you do it right, and uh, you're gonna you're gonna get there. If you don't, you got no chance of ever getting there. And uh, you know, young guys usually a promoter like that, a young guy, 
uh, he's not going to listen to. He's got his own ideas. And, uh, you know, this guy, this guy, evidently, he, he really listened to a lot of guys that had been around and it really he exploded his own little area yeah. there, man. Yes, he did. He listened to a lot of guys. And then he updated things by doing different merchandise now. And uh, for the company, you know, he has little pins and different uh, posters that he gives out. But he he sells a season ticket of 10 shows in the first row. Uh, so uh, 100 seats, he charges $1,000 for the year. And people buy them not knowing what they're going to see, but they know they're going to see a good show. So that says something. Still, he's smarter than I was. <laughs> <laughs> I remember doing the world champ. I remember the first time I ever wanted it. I got the idea. In fact, uh, in my stud cast, uh, I'm in 1976. I'm about two weeks away from me wrestling Terry Funk for the world title. And I took my first row ringside and I put a $10 ticket price on it. And, uh, and I thought, Oh my God. And in, fa in fact, when my dad heard about it, he goes, what are you doing, boy? You got your T you got to, you think they're going to buy? I said, dad, I think they'll buy them first. And he was like, nah. And sure enough, they bought them first. So the next world championship match I had was against me with me against Harley race about six months later. And I did $20 ringside for the first three rows. I said, I'm going to do it for three rows and I'm going to make it $20. And those were the first tickets that were sold. It was like, wow, how stupid have we been all this time? You know, I mean, so this guy's smart enough to get that money for a year and they don't know who the hell they're even going to see. So, you know, yeah. my hat's off to that boy. Yeah. 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 Pretty smart. Uh, I love it. You know, kind of just going back to Brad Armstrong for a second. How come he didn't become a bigger star? Like, uh, Ron, what do you think? How come it didn't kind of blossom for Brad the way it did for, you know, obviously for Bullet Bob, who became a huge star? Well, I think Brad was a little smaller than Bob, for one thing. He wasn't quite as big and muscular as Bob. Uh, and, and I just think Brad didn't, he got overlooked. I mean, everybody knew how talented Brad was. All the guys in the dressing room, all the damn promoters, everybody knew that kid had it, you know. And uh, uh, it, it's really strange how some guys just seem to get picked out and some guys don't. Uh, Brad could have a match with a broomstick. I mean, Brad could do it. He, he just was phenomenal. And he deserved to, to be pushed a lot more than he was pushed. That's for sure. He just had immense talent and, uh, and just that ability to, uh, to, to move and to go drop kick. I, I've, I've watched some of his matches lately uh, on the YouTube and, and I see Brad's drop kick and I'm like, wow, that kid, I don't remember him being able to drop kick that kid. <laughs> but I, he was just, he could do it all. He was really a super talented kid. Uh, we used him pretty good. I mean, obviously, he's the first son of Bob. So when he came along and I saw his talent right away, uh, we we put the belt on him. We put the world junior title on him. And we did some things like that that a lot of other people didn't do. But uh, the, those that didn't do missed the boat, I think. He was really a talented kid. He, Kevin, what do you think uh, about uh, Brad? Okay. Rick Flair says... He's on the top five of the best workers he ever worked with. Ronald, I'm going to ask, ask you this question, and I'm asking John too, but you, you know, you were, he was an employee for you, just like I was. Brad went along with things where he might have, hey, uh, this t t times are different, but when you and I were in business, there was a little bit of, Okay, someone's going to tell Ronald he's losing tonight. Not that you wouldn't do it, but there was, you know, why are you doing this? Tell me where we're going. I'll do it, no problem, but what, what do you have for me for the next few weeks? How am I going to, you know, get back into the main event picture? Where Brad was so laid back, he'd say, okay, sure, whatever you want. Do you think that has something to do with it, Ronald? Yes, yes, yes. And, you know, and not only that, Kev, but uh, 
Brad was one of the greatest guys I ever saw in a dressing room. Uh, yes. he, he just, he lit up dressing rooms. He just yeah. went around. Everybody loved Brad. He yeah. just was, it, it was a party to Brad. Wrestling yeah. was a party for Brad. Just being there in that dressing room and patting yeah. guys on the back and playing these little pranks and all the little jokes. Uh, and I always loved to have those type of guys in the dressing room because yeah. that, that transfers to, to action in the ring. When guys are happy in the dressing room, they're going to go give you something extra in the ring. And uh, Brad was one of those guys. I really loved that about him. But you're probably right, Kev. Had he stepped had he stepped up and said, hey, well, wait a minute. And one of the reasons see, I don't think he did that is because when he started, he started for me and Bob, and, and nobody ever said that to us. Nobody ever said, oh, well, what are we, what, what we going to do later? Because most yeah. of the time, if a guy was a top guy, he knew he wasn't going to get screwed. He's just right. going to be, yeah. you, you're you going to do this tonight, but you're going to be back where you were. It's not going to, right. we're not right. demoting you by by uh, putting somebody over you tonight. And, uh, you know, so Brad saw that. He grew up like that. And he probably didn't speak up. You're right. He should have spoke up. He'd probably been handled differently. And the other thing, Ronald, I have to agree with him, John. There was nobody funnier in the dress room, and everybody when they walked in the dress room saw Brad. Their faces lit up. Right, Brad was so funny, but he couldn't translate the great wit and humor he had and the great talking ability into interviews like his father did. His father was one of the greatest interviewers of all times, and it was just that he had that laid back attitude. And when you watch Brad work, he was so fluid. It came so easy to Brad at in such a young age, you know. Uh, and it, but what you said, Ronald, is somebody should have taken him and done something with him. You know what I mean? You guys kept him good, but I mean, I could see him, him have gone to, we'll say, uh, Minnesota and and fit in with the the Ganya and. Bronzel and had a hell of a run against them, you know? So oh, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe that. I believe that. Uh, I believe Jet, Brad would have made a great uh, world junior heavyweight champion. Yes, uh, I do it, too. It, perfect weight class, uh, just the right size, uh, and it could do everything. You're right. He, he couldn't interview quite as well as his dad did. And I think that was because when he started, Bob was partnering with him quite a bit and Bob was handling those interviews and Brad right. never got to, he was learning the skills in the ring, but he didn't have the opportunity to learn the skills on the mic that he needed right. to, to, later on. It would have been helped him right. if, uh, if he hadn't have been partners with Bob, it would probably help him if he'd had to do his own interviews from the beginning. That's, Definitely. That's and quite true. Yeah. And I do think with uh, Bullet Bob, I feel like he had all the qualities. He could work, he could talk, uh, he could brawl, but he was a good technician. And then each kid, I feel like, had one distinct thing they were really good at. Like Kevin said, Road Dog is a really good talker, Brian. Brad was the worker. Maybe Steve was more the brawler and Scotty's more the technician. But I feel like he gave each of them something of his, but not all of his skills. Yeah. And, and you know what? Nobody had all of Bob's skills. <laughs> right. <laughs> Very few guys in the business ever had all of what Bob had. I mean, right. you know, he had the body. He had the body, too. And, you know, that, yeah. that you didn't mention. And that was, to me, that was Bob's biggest asset, man. He, he, he hit those weights. And, and he wanted to look better than everybody else. And he would just had... And when you have all those talents and you can do that, and you can bump good and you can heal good, you can baby face good, you can talk good, you can work great. I mean, and you got the body too. You, you're, you're just, they don't come any better than that. I, I think that's why I said when I went down and started Pensacola, I want to take this guy with me and I don't want him to just be a wrestler and leave me in a couple of years. I want him to be a part of it and I want him to stay forever. And, uh, you know, uh, you can't do better when you're running a company than having a great talent and knowing that they're going to be there with you for many, many years. You just keep switching them back from heel to baby face and uh, they never tire out. 
I used to like to take guys and keep them for a year and let them go for a year. And when you bring them back, every time you bring them back, they come back stronger than when they left. Uh, heel or baby face didn't make any difference. And, you know, so uh, that's kind of what we did with Bob. And Bob and I, we would book every other year. And then I would let my brother book on the off years. And we would take our time. And once we were, we were out of the territory and Rob was booking there, he would bring in his own crew. And uh, Bob and I would go to places like Atlanta to work on the TV where we could be seen nationwide and worldwide. I mean, you know, we, we just utilize those, those that, that time frame to get ourselves over in more than just the territory in which we own. And uh, Bob was smart about that. He, he realized that uh, that was a good thing for him and later on for Brad and his boys. Yep, yep. Now, as far as like some of the best guys that you guys, as far as drawing, you know, who, who's been the best and who's been the worst? I don't know if Kevin, what you want to go first or Ron, you want to go first, but as far as like territory guys, best draw, worst draw. You mean in Ronald's territories? No, well, he, well, when you were booking or, 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 you know, wherever you think, it, as far as maybe when you were booking Florida versus when Ron was booking Florida. Well, when I was booking Florida, I had a very young Barry Windham. I had Black Jack Mulligan. I had Mike Rotunda. I had uh, Ron Bass. I had Black Bart. I had Billy Jack. I had Mark Lewin. I had King Curtis. I had Bruiser Brody in and out, and I had the original Sheik in and out. So I had a pretty stacked uh, uh, card. So, and I I would bring Brad in occasionally if he was in between Ronald's, uh, between uh, Pensacola or Knoxville, or if he went to Atlanta, I'd bring Brad in. I'd use him in the middle. And I and I, I was using the junior world junior heavyweight belt when Thornton had it, so I knew I was going to have great match. And when the only time that uh, Tony would leave Ronald, he'd come to me for maybe three or four months. And uh, I had Adrian Street, who Ronald drew big big money with. So we had a, a world class guys that drew money. Ronald, on the other hand, had young talent who were brand new that could work and hadn't been seen over and over again, in my opinion. And then he had the big guns, him and him and Bob on top with Ronald and uh, the Mongolian stopper, who is another guy, for some reason doesn't get the credit he deserves about drawing all the money. Yeah, yeah, and, he was a, that, a real talent. Yeah, so that's a hell of a crew, Kev. Yeah, yeah. You, you, yeah. Just, you, you just had a hell of a crew to work with there, yeah. man. Uh, that was yeah. that would uh, that should have been easy to book them boys, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> having yeah, that kind of group. Was, I looked around the dressing room on TV, and one of the guys I forgot to mention too, too was besides Curtis, I had superstar Billy Graham. After you know, uh, he when he was making his comeback, he was superstar Billy Graham, and he was a heel with me and Humperdink, and we did this angle and turned him babyface. And when I saw what he did as a babyface, I said, "Boy, they made a big mistake in New York years ago." He was hot. So I mean, like you said, Ronald, that was pretty easy. That booked itself. You know, you just yeah. needed to give the guys make sure that they got a couple of days off every once in a while and keep them happy. Like, you know, because the trips were a little longer, but the thing about working in Ronald's territory, you were home every night, you know what I mean? And it was easy trips and it was hey, like I said, you either, uh, water skiing on Norris dam Lake, or you were down in the, uh, Pensacola scuba diving. It was great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I couldn't afford to get all those guys, all that good talent you're talking about. So I had to I had to set my territories up in good places, you know. 
I had the yeah. lakes up there in Tennessee, and I had the ocean right there, the Gulf in uh, Pensacola, and uh, you know. But I was really lucky. I did I did have a lot of guys that came through. A lot of guys went on to become huge stars. Started with me, uh, Honky Tonk Man got his start there. Uh, uh, geez, it just so many of uh, uh, Hulk Hogan started there. Brutus the Barber Beefcake started there. Uh, you know, Arn Anderson started there. Uh, Olympia, Mr. Olympia, Jerry Stubbs came out of there. Uh, you know, just we just created a whole lot of stars out of young guys that were really talented that just hadn't, uh, they didn't know how good they were, you know. And, and, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt, but John what Ronald also could do. He could get guys that had been around for years that never really got a break. Give him a different gimmick and drew money, like Chris Colt. John, do you know who Chris Colt is? Yeah, just a little bit, but not as familiar with him. Lower card guy, right? He's the one of the greatest bump takers in the world. He was a, a, a very erratic guy. He was Janis Joplin's bodyguard, but he could take bumps. Ronald brought him in. He tore down the house, gave the babyface an incredible match because when the babyface made the comeback, he took these Ray Stevens-type bumps. Then Ronald brought in the Samoans again, who had been around for years in the middle and made them the headhunters from the Guinea. The people bought into them, and it was, I mean, he used guys that people had discarded and not gotten the money they should out of. Like, you know, we were talking about Brad. Ronald got his money out of Brad because of the longevity, and he was always in a good position and always gave a great match. These other guys I mentioned, they came through because they were different. They knew they were going to be there six, eight months. They were going to have a good time living where they were. Ronald was a great payoff man. So they worked their ass off every night because every week they were trying to extend their stay there. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you, like Ronald and I have talked. You didn't want Bob saying to you in Pensacola one night, "Hey, can I talk to you for a second in this room?" <laughs> you, you knew it was. You, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I always gave Bob that bad it. job. Uh, I yeah. always gave Bob that rotten job of giving guys notice. <laughs> And I told him early on, man, when we went down there, I said, "Bob, just one thing I'm going to ask you to do that you're probably not going to like." And he says, what's that? And I said, well, I don't like to give guys notices, and I'm going to give you that job. And, uh, you know, Bob was always – everybody liked him so much, man. They couldn't, they couldn't say anything yeah. about it. And, uh, and most guys had had a good run, and they wanted to come back. So they, right. they didn't want to burn the bridge before they left. They, they were always nice and say, yeah, can I come back? How soon can I come back? Yeah. Well, if you, if you talk to uh, – Andrew, uh, uh, Aaron Anderson. Aaron tells me that was the happiest time of his life, that he loved Pensacola. And he said it was a dream. And I can imagine what a young Aaron Anderson's matches were like. I mean, you got to see him before he got hurt or, uh, you know, hurt bad like he did. And so, he, I mean, Aaron's a, one of them. There's a guy... He, people say, yeah, he's a great, a good worker. No, he's not a good worker. He's a great worker. I don't yeah. use that word very often. The guy's a great worker, but Double A is a great worker. Yeah, yeah. I had him in my stud stable. It didn't take long to get him put in my stud stable. Uh, one of the best tag teams I ever saw was Arn Anderson and Jerry Stubbs, his Mr. Olympia. Uh, uh, I can... Wow. That. I mean, God, man, uh, great that both of them could move like crazy, have a tremendous match with whoever. It didn't make any difference uh, night after night. You knew when they went to the ring that uh, they were going to tear the house down, and they always did. Uh, so, And then, you know, I switched him back and forth to Olympia. I switched to Babyface on Arn, and I had them go at each other before it's all over. I utilized guys as well as I could. I wanted to keep that good talent there as long as I could. And sometimes uh, I'd Peter put a team like that together as a heel team and then uh, turn Arn, turn uh, Jerry Stubbs, Mr. Olympia, babyface on Arn. 
and uh, you know, it just uh, I did a whole lot of things that a lot of people probably wouldn't have done. Gave us good, good longevity. Uh, same guys, uh, great matches every night. That's what was so important. Yeah, yeah. Now I don't know, Kev, if you'll be as familiar with this, but Ron, the infamous Plan B with Bob Roop and Boris Malenko and Ronnie Garvin and Cowboy Bob Orton. I mean, this is a shocking, shocking thing that went down. But, you know, please tell us a little bit about Plan B. Uh, Plan B is, uh, in 1979, I had a wrestling war. Uh, I brought in Bob Roop to book for me. And uh, and I didn't know Bob's history. If I had, I probably wouldn't have put him in that position. But uh, a couple of years earlier, he had tried to, to, to take away Roy Shire's territory, try to get control of Roy Shire's territory out there in San Francisco. And he came into my territory. I was back and forth. I was just building Southeastern in Pensacola. I just bought it. So I was spending a lot of time in the South. And, uh, and I was depending on uh, Bob to take care of business in the North. And Bob got, uh, you know, he got to where he, he, uh, I think he thought that he, that, uh, that uh, he was being cheated money-wise. And, I, you know, I didn't have a reputation for cheating guys money-wise. It was never a deal. Nobody ever had a problem with it until Bob Roop came along. You know, and I think he was trying to convince some guys that, hey, we're not getting paid properly. And uh, so end up turning into a war. And as the war went on, uh, obviously, we ran in the Coliseum. They ran on the next night in Chihuahua Park uh, in the outside amphitheater. And their business wasn't good. Our business wasn't as good nearly as it was before, which is traditionally happens in wrestling wars. Uh, both people suffer. And anyway, they toward the end of this time, probably in six months, I, I sold out. I basically sold out to uh, Jim Barnett out of Georgia. And they decided that, uh, that uh, they were going to do this video that they were going to, I don't know if the, what their plan was, but they called the video Plan B. And uh, the, all I can think is they were planning on maybe taking this video and and uh, circulating it around the territories and maybe, uh, you know, threatening the promoters and, and uh, blackmailing them into money maybe, you know. Hey, well, yeah, here's the, we're going to send this into your territory and get it on your TV and uh, then, or either you pay us and we won't come in, or uh, I, I don't know how what their plan was, but uh, when I first saw it, I never saw that video for 30 years. And wow. I had a guy, and uh, I was doing, about to do a super stud cast on the, the my Knoxville war. And the guy sent me a, something on Facebook. He says, Ron, have you ever seen what's called Plan B video? And I said, no, what are you talking about? And he sent me that video. Well, you can imagine, Kev, what I did. I mean, watching that, like, oh, my God, is, it, is this for real? <laughs> I mean, were they really going to do this, you know? So uh, their plan was if they didn't win, they were going to kill Knoxville, obviously. And then they were probably going to utilize that stuff to somehow make money off of other promoters by threatening them. Yeah, I, 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 I'm know of it john very well i saw it just recently the first time mm -hmm. I, I saw it but i was approached by roop to jump right wow said, okay I, I said to him how am i gonna uh, do this to ronald who's a friend of mine but he says you're not making the money you deserve i says last week I traveled 330 miles, and one of the trips was 220 round trip, right? So that meant the other five days, I traveled 110 miles, and it was, I left my boat at 630, okay? <laughs> and I made, and I was on the semi-main event, I made $990 back in 1997. The guys, uh, when they opened a match, made six fifty. I said, explain to me how he's stealing. I said, I'm pretty good with figures. And they're supposed to pay 33 and a third percent. Some of these spot shows, he's paying 80%. And he said, 
Oh, no, no, you're going to get screwed. But I'm going to tell you what I think the story is wrong. Do you remember they said there's homosexuality involved in it? <laughs> yeah, I think I do remember. You remember that, John? You remember that? He said that part, said, no. No. Go back and look at it because he said, okay. and there was homosexuality, we're going to expose it. You had just sold it to Barnett. They had a meeting and Barnett bought the mouse. They had not paid them. And they, they, that was what their whole plan was, I think, was try to embarrass uh, Jim. I mean, it was common knowledge in the wrestling business, John, that Jim was gay. Right. But Jim, he, Jim never fooled with any of the boys. And Jim was, you know, he was a, a, a wonderful promoter, too. And a very smart guy. And Ronald worked for him. I worked for him. And I think we both learned a lot from him because he was very, very uh, smart in the way he did business. If you look at how Ronald did business, it was very similar to how Jim did business. He got incredibly hot heels and got hot angles going and, and drew money. But I think they were going to try to expose him. And I think he gave them some money, Ronald, because years later, uh, Bob Orton told me he was at a meeting and he put his feet on the desk up in Knoxville. And I'm not sure, but I think when Jim brought Mark Lewin to Atlanta, he was going to have him be the booker in Knoxville. And that only lasted a couple of weeks. And he brought Mark Eat back to Atlanta. And then Knoxville was just used as a casual spot show. Yeah. See, I never knew that, but that makes yeah. sense. And I do remember in just one of those guys, and I can't remember which one mentioned Malenko. something about, yeah, something about, you know, uh, the, uh, homosexuality, uh, some little, and it, and it was very vague, but, uh, yeah, you know, that Malenko. would make sense because, uh, you know, Jim was the type that, when he when he ended the Atlanta war, he bought out Gunkel. He bought out Ann. Right. You know, uh, he he was right. that type of guy. He didn't want the the uh, the people that lost the war basically to go away with nothing. And I think he felt like he would never have a problem with them again if they if he did buy it from them and give them something. And so right. in that case, he knew these guys had lost that they had they had been there for six months and starving because they weren't drawing. And uh, then, the, you know, he just wanted to give them something. And, and they, if they were if they were threatening him with that part of it, uh, that would make more sense for him to buy them out and uh, just, yeah. uh, just stop all this. And, and, you know, it's amazing. How does, how does, a, how does this video like that uh, sit uh, hidden for 30 years? Yeah. That's what's amazing in the wrestling business. You know, how in the world did they, who did they give it to and, and how, how, how did they keep them quiet for that long? It just... And I can't, I can't understand that either. You know, how do you get four guys to keep a secret and not, not only them, the guy that shot it, the lighting guy and whoever they gave that tape to, because it sat there forever. And I'd like to know this. Who exposed it? Yeah. I, the guy that sent it to me didn't give me his name. He <laughs> said, I think you need to see this, Ron. And he wow. sent it to me. He, did, he wouldn't tell me who it was. And uh, and there was a fifth guy, too. Ron Wright. Ron Wright. Was in that. Ron Wright. Yeah, Ron yeah. Wright was in that, too. So there were five yeah. guys that all stood up and, and just blatantly said, it's all the work. Yep. You know, it's, it's all the work. Uh, expose the business. Ever. Yep. Yeah, they expose the business. I mean, uh, never seen anybody expose the business like that before. It's like, wow. And, and listen to this that nobody ever thinks about. Do you know how many guys, families, went hungry for a while because of that bullshit they did? And they oh. were all on top making money. They all had boats, big boats. We all had boats. If you work Ronald's territory in Knoxville, everybody had the bay liner or uh, bay shore or whatever. I mean, we all had a slip at the dock. 
I mean, it was crazy. And they wanted they were want to take the money out. And then when it died, I mean, people stayed as long as they could. But you know, you you Ronald can't make his bills paying the building and paying the guys if the territory's drawn an eighth of what it used to draw. I mean, those guys, they was guys only in it for themselves, and they were making the most money of all anybody in the territory. Yeah, they were doing, they were doing very well. They were doing very well. And, and the worst part about it, Kev, is, uh, is they killed a, a tremendous town. They killed a tremendous yeah. little territory for, for five years. So I left there yeah. in 79. I went to Pensacola, never looked back. Uh, but in 1985, when I changed the name of Southeastern to Continental, uh, I got I had a guy at the TV station call me up and said, would you like to bring your wrestling show back to Knoxville? And uh, everybody that had been there since I left in 79 had died. Uh, I mean, no matter who owned it, uh, Barnett died, uh, Mulligan died, Flair died. Uh, yeah. Whoever went in there and tried to run it, nobody had any success. And we took everybody back up there the very first night. Bob Armstrong on the card, me on the card, Rob on the card, Jimmy on the card. Uh, all these guys that had been big time. Uh, Stomper came back and worked for you know, on those cards uh, and uh, and went back and, and sold out the Coliseum the very first night back in 1985. Wow. And sold it out many, many times after that. It just, uh, it was like those fans, uh, they never bought into anybody else after we left. And they just wanted those old stars to come back. And uh, yeah. once we came back, it was like, uh, like we never left. It was amazing homecoming. Right, right. And it's crazy to think that those guys like Ron Garvin and Bob Orton and Malenko would even be a part of something like that. I could believe Roop, but I can't believe the other guys would be a part of it. You know, what was really bad, too, is uh, Ron Garvin and uh, all those guys could have gone to to, to, to Pensacola. Right. <laughs> yeah. They, they not only killed themselves with any opportunity in Knoxville, they, they lost any opportunity to ever come working down there in Pensacola where, where guys like Garvin would have loved it just as much or more. He would yep. have been like, God, this is better than Knoxville. <laughs> so, right. right. Bigger cities, more money. Right. Crazy. Very, very true. Now, Kevin, I don't know if you'll know this, but I saw Ron and his brother um, at an autograph signing. I was like, wow, you know, Rob Fuller is huge. Then Ron comes in the room. I'm like, wow, Ron Fuller must be seven foot tall. He's huge. Kevin, how tall is he really? I mean, he is a monster, isn't he? He's Well, <laughs> when I used to work, work with Ronald, I'd come up to his nuts. <laughs> let me let's measure him from his nuts to the top of his head so i'm five eight so whatever that is he might be seven eight for christ's sake uh, <laughs> Ron, what's your official height uh six nine you're six, okay six, nine. so yeah you know i'm uh, pretty tall for a wrestler you know uh and, uh, you know, it took me a long time to gain weight. I started out pretty thin. Probably took me three years to get to 240, 250. Uh, so, you know, it, it took me a while to get the body, to make my body catch up to the height. But, uh, you know, I was one of the taller guys in the business. And uh, and I like to I like to wrestle the style of, of a small guy. I didn't want to be a tall, big man that couldn't move. I wanted to move just like anybody else could. Uh, flying head scissors, it didn't make any difference. If you could do it, I could do it. And, uh, you yeah. know, I think that, that benefited me some, too. And the other thing, John, him and Robert were a very good team. They were a very good team. And a very good team at a young age. And then they kind of drifted apart because Ronald was in West Palm. Like I said... They were, I believe they were preparing Ronald for being on the short list, like the top five guys who were going to make world champion. And that's why he started going to St. Louis as a single. And it, that's how I got put with Robert when I first got to Florida. 
Wow. That was, would have been uh, quite a you know change in history if you would have been the uh, NWA World Heavyweight Champion. So, uh, you know, or at least, you know, you had some good feuds with uh, Flair and, and Funk in, along the way, though. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And I think, you know, here's the thing. There is a time where, you know, Ronald could have been a great champion between when Terry Funk was the champion, if he beat Terry and they wanted to move the belt later on to Holly or back to Terry or even Junior, it would have been a great position for him. It would have been a great position for the, the Florida wrestling, but it would have been a great thing where they, they would have had a baby face lose to a heel champion. They didn't have to have a heel versus heel, you know, when they did Terry and uh, Harley that one time. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 fl flair, uh, switch it back and forth so many times. So, yeah, no yeah, obviously, I could have brought Rob in too. That would have worked out good. I had a brother. If we were going to yeah. work, for, broke some kind of angles with the Funks, I got, I, there'd be two brother teams. Yeah. And, uh, yep. you know, yeah. that would have been. Uh, Jimmy Golden, I could have brought in Jimmy, Jimmy, my cousin, and, uh, you know, done things with him just like I did with Rob. And it would have uh, it would have had a lot of uh, given us a lot of different opportunities and a lot of different angles that could have been worked, obviously. Right. right. So I just right. bought them in for myself. You know, that was good. I just, <laughs> I just went ahead and booked them for myself, man. Yep. And, uh, and uh, drew great money with those guys. Uh, never got to do any much of the tag team angles that we could have possibly done. But, but uh, really, really, uh, you know, and what it was too, Kev, uh, is I, I, it may be my fault that I didn't get the, the, the call because when you become a promoter, uh, yeah. you're saying a lot to those guys about where you want to go with your career. Yeah. You know, when you when you start your own promotion. Then all of a sudden they're uh, they're going well, you know. JC, he can't promote. He can't own a territory and be the world champion. You yeah, know how yeah. you do that? You know you're committed. And and I yeah. and I, I looking back, I, I don't regret it. If they had that in mind, I don't regret where I went because uh, I got to live at home. I got to be home every night. Uh, yeah. I, I I made damn good money. Uh, I got to own my run, uh, own my own thing. I got to be the booker and the owner. Uh, yeah. I got to, I got the, uh, I had all the, uh, the great part of uh, being a success and uh, building territories and, and the fun of ownership of a territory and having friends of yours in your, seeing them every night. You know, I mean, uh, I was I was around guys I really liked, and they were really enjoying where they were, and uh, the atmosphere was always positive, and it was just it was a great way to go through the sport. I, I don't know that I would have taken the world belt uh, as com as uh, as compared to where the direction I went. Yeah, I think you did the right thing if they ever offered it to you. I think that was the right thing to do, Ronald. You've lived a remarkable life. Yeah, yep. had a now, great life. Now, as we head towards the finish line here, Ron, I know you've got a lot of awesome stuff, your stud cast, but also a new book, Brutus. Yeah, yeah, I have a book, and it's not a wrestling book. I guess that's strange. I mean, uh, you know, I may be the only wrestler that doesn't have a wrestling book. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Maybe Mick Foley's written some kind of a kid book or whatever, you know. But, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I have a I have a stud cast, uh, and, and it's uh, it's a weekly product. I, it drops every Wednesday, and it basically I'm just telling my family's history. I started out with my granddad in 1920. Uh, I'm about 170 episodes in, and and I'm just now to 1976. So I've got a long way to go to finish that out, and I, I basically just take it almost a week at a time. And, uh, and explain the business to fans that want to learn about wrestling and how it was done and how I figured the angles and how I figured how I set up coliseums and buildings and just really try to educate fans that are old school fans uh, 
Uh, I have a super stud cast that's once a month, three hour product that's on Patreon. And it's also on my website, which is tnstud.com. Uh, or you can pick it up on Patreon. Uh, and in fact, the last one is a tribute to Bob Armstrong that we've talked about. And it's got eight wrestlers on that sucker, and Kevin's one of them. You know, uh, with guys that are spending 20, 30 minutes telling how they felt about Bob Armstrong. It's a tremendous show. I mean, it, it's four and a half hours long for two ninety nine. dollars so, and, uh, and then my book is, uh, is about a dream I had in 1998 when I was living just on the outskirts of the Smoky Mountain National Park and had a dream about a lion one night that got loose in the National Park. And, and I just kept waking up and I'd go back to sleep and the dream would continue and continue. And I got up the next day and said, I'm going to write a book. So I wrote this book and the lion's name is Brutus. And basically it's a lot more involved than that. It grew. Once I started to write the book, the story just grew. And uh, before it was over, the story was writing me. I mean, you know, it was like, wow, where's this going? You know, but uh, it's turned out to be a great book. I'm, my reviews are just unreal. I've got, I don't have anything but five-star reviews. Uh, every wow. review I've got, and I've got more than 25 now, and it's only been out for about six weeks. Uh, every review is five stars. Everybody that's read it. And uh, I've sold Japan books uh, England in England, big fans in England. So, you know, it's, the fans want to look it up. Uh, it's a, you can find it at amazon.com. Uh, Look under under Brutus novel, novel Brutus, and uh, they can find it there. And it's on my website, tnstud.com, which I got a lot of things on there. All of my stud casts are on there. All my super stud casts are on there. And, uh, you know, and the book is there. In fact, I got an autograph version. The only place you can get it is on the tnstud.com site. So if fans want to take a look at it. Uh, you know, the book is really, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, totally different. It's, it, the comparison is, and it's pretty amazing, they say it's the next Jaws. Wow. wow. So, you know, you can't be, uh, can't get compared to one much bigger than that one. So I hope they're right about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping that's the truth. Awesome um, stuff. Kevin, any parting words for the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller? Uh, I as usual, Ronald, it was my pleasure. You brought uh, a lot of fond memories. You were the best guy I ever worked for. Uh, you know, you, you were always more than fair to everybody that worked for you. I've never heard anybody but those Plan B bullshit ever say anything bad when you, I bring up your name. So that says something about your reputation. Thanks again, my friend. Well, thank you. And, uh, and I want to thank you too, Kevin. I mean, uh, same thing here, man. You and I go back uh, 50 years and, uh, you know, I just have tremendous respect for you. You're one of those guys that did it all, man. And uh, you were able to become bookers and, uh, you know, just uh, you, you worked your way from the bottom to the top and, uh, and you, you just uh, had great success all the way. And, and I always enjoy being around you and always, and I, and I want to come see you out there where you are, man. Uh, I'm sure you live you in a beautiful too. spot. Yes, I want you to too. Hey, I'll I'll show you my backyard. Can you see it? Whoa! Oh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, dog man. Yeah. Yes, sir, uh, really. Now I really want to come. How about tomorrow, yeah. man? <laughs> yeah, jump on a plane. Uh, so I, I do you want to plug our thing, John? Yeah, before we uh, kind of wrap it up, I will mention you could follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Two Man Power Trip. You can follow Kevin on Instagram at Taskmaster Talks. You can go to ProWrestlingTees.com and get a Kevin Sullivan shirt. And of course, like he has on right now, even go to Double Hell, Double Hell t shirts. You got an awesome Taskmaster shirt on there. They have many other shirts. So go to Double Hell Wrestling Shirts and check it out. I mean, they're on Twitter. You check out their website, but awesome Kevin Sullivan shirts. I love each shirt in the line. I'm hoping to get one very, very soon. So thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Ron Fuller. It's been an honor and a privilege to have you on. Thank, thank you, everybody, for joining us this week on Taskmaster Talks. We will see you next week, folks. Have a good Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. 
Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews, match videos, or news updates. Support us on Patreon.com for $1.99 a month to watch our full shoot interviews ad-free and help our channel grow. Follow us on Twitter at The Hannibal TV for instant updates.